Hey everybody, this is the Alex Manassa here to tell you how an engineer thinks. So, I don't know if you remember from a few years ago, back in 2008, 2007, when the Dow was dropping 700, 800 points a day. I forget. It was a lot. It was enough to make my economics class grind to a screeching halt as the professor gets an alert on his phone that his 401k is worth about a quarter as much as it used to be, right? Uh, the housing crisis was rough. Everyone's money was tied up into houses. The house had inflated prices. They bought in high. And then once the housing crisis hit, boom. Housing prices hit the floor. Uh, tons of people's wealth were, was wiped out. Tons of people were in underwater in debt. Uh, it's not going to be as, as bad as that was. It's not going to be nearly as bad as the student loan crisis that'll hit, I'm pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> but that'll be a topic for another video. Uh, I want to tell you how I, as an engineer, as a free thinker, as a critical thinker, survived the housing crisis and actually did extremely well. I never told anybody this story. Um, I graduated college in 2011, right? So it's just a little bit after all that happened. The dust has settled. It's not an active crisis mode, uh, or else I'd probably have a lot of trouble getting any sort of home loan. But the housing crisis hit right while I was in school, and everyone freaked out. Uh, we had students actually living in their cars. Uh, students who used to be really rich, like ones who used to you know, brag about how much money they had, and they would take everybody out to sushi and drinks, and now all of a sudden they're living in their car. It was real. Stuff got really real. Uh, big problem that happened, I'm just gonna move this light. Big problem that happened uh, was that we all wanted to know what we're gonna do for a job when we graduate. So I, my degree was in engineering physics, which is ABET accredited, so it is actual engineering but we studied the physics side of things. Uh, the thinking was that we would build the scientific instrumentation uh, that would go on satellites and you know do ground measurements of different things in the atmosphere, yada, yada, yada. Pretty much we knew how to engineer a scientific experiment, which means you need to know the science behind the experiment. Not, you know, <laughs> it's not the most lucrative uh, career position. It's not like everyone, anyone's ever like looking through a bunch of resumes and says, Oh, an engineering physicist, what's that? And then the other guy says, oh, that's a combination of engineering and physics. And the other guy says, hot damn, we should hire this guy. What he says is in reality, electrical engineer, nope. Computer engineer, nope. Uh, trash, throw it out. Uh, being special it has its uh, detriments, right, in the real world. Um, <clears throat> and we were all concerned because everybody in, in the year of the housing crisis and the year afterwards, uh, none of the graduating class had a job lined up, and that was that was bad. I know the graduating class was only like maybe a two dozen people because we were a really small program, but still, that's that's pretty bad. Well, not a single person has a job lined up, right? So I got to thinking. Uh, first thing I realized, you know, as a critical thinker, is that if none of these people, adults, professors, experts, th this is really the year that expertise died, by the way, uh, because all the experts were shouting at, I think his name was Peter Schiff. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. I think it was Peter Schiff was the guy who said the housing crisis was coming and he'd said it for years and everyone ridiculed him. All the experts ridiculed him. Krugman from the New York Times ridiculed him. Um, I don't know, the, the guy, who, the, the prop comic who passes for uh, investment advice on the other channel. I forget. I think it's Jim Cramer. I for everybody was ridiculing this guy for saying the housing crisis was coming. And then it hit. And now all of a sudden, everyone who didn't predict it was going to try and tell us how to get out of it. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, I realized that the expertise was done and I needed to forge ahead with my own path. And that's kind of the way you should build your life. You are forging your own path. Uh, don't take... Experts are just there to give you information and to give you some insight. Never do anything that someone tells you to do just because they told you to do it and they seem like they know what they're doing. No one knows what they're doing. Not, not even me. So just take the information I give you, see if you can apply it in your own life, right? Uh, I listened to people who are doing the hiring and the firing. Um, we have every ABET accredited program has an industrial advisory board. The industrial advisory board is a group of people in the industry who do the hiring and firing. They come to your school, they give like a town hall, they evaluate your program, make sure it's still good, right? <clears throat> and that's part of keeping your ABET accreditation. By the way, if your engineering program is not ABET accredited, it is garbage. Just don't go. Like, forget it. 
I mean, it's got to have at least an ABET accredited program in the school. I think there's a rule between graduate programs and undergraduate. You can't have both. So if you have like electrical engineering undergraduates not ABET accredited, but your graduate program is, it's probably just because they could only accredit one. I don't know what the rules exactly are, but you should definitely, if you're talking to a college recruiter, definitely ask them about ABET accreditation. And if they give you an answer that's anything less than yes, then don't go to that program. Yeah. Uh, I've known some people who got into six-figure debt over a degree that I, I is not even worth wiping your butt with, honestly. Anyways, <clears throat> uh, the good news about that is that your degree doesn't actually make a bit of difference, especially now that Yale and Harvard have completely discredited themselves with this social justice crap. Uh, take the advice I'm about to give you and apply it to today. It is just as relevant. Listen to the hirers and the firers. Ask them exactly what they want. When I ask the Industrial Advisory Board what job skills do you think translate the most from academics to the industry, they told me writing lab reports. And I was like, what? We spend half a credit, like, or one credit doing chemistry lab reports. I was like, no, that's the most important thing, your ability to communicate. And I was like, oh, yeah, kind of makes sense. I mean, these days, it's not like some singular Thomas Edison or Wiley Post is out there inventing things. We do things as a team. You have to be able to communicate. Uh, effective, effectively, efficiently, concisely, and clearly, right? Uh, so, yeah, lab report, that was a big surprise. No one told me that. Professors weren't telling me that. I, you know, we were taking quantum physics. I thought that was important. No, not. <laughs> quantum physics and calculus and all these other classes that are really hard are just there to see how smart you are. That's it. Sometimes being too smart is actually a big detriment. Uh, sorry about the air conditioner. Um, is actually a big detriment, and having a 4.0 can sort of tell the recruiter that you might not have a life. So if you have a 4.0, round that out with some other activities, social activity, you know, and when I mean social, I mean like being president of a club or something, you know, where you're taking, you're engaging with people and you're dealing with politics or something like that. Uh, have some kind of well-rounded activity that you do to keep yourself sane, right? Uh, sports is really good. Sports is super good, by the way. Uh, and other than that, have a good sense of humor. I think a sense of humor is probably one of the most underrated job-getting skills uh, out there. Uh, humor indicates that you are able to keep your morale up. Because if you have a good sense of humor, you can endure pretty much anything. The better your sense of humor, the better you'll endure. If you ever watch like an old war movie, uh, there is probably, a, you know, and they're really in it. There's a good chance that there's a scene in there where someone cracks a joke and people laugh. Like, even in, like, the Pacific or Band of Brothers and other stuff like that, like, there's a there's a scene where people are having a good laugh. You need that. It's really important to have a good sense of humor. It also tells me that you can take feedback. So, because if you can make fun of yourself, then that means that I can criticize you, too. It's like, hey, Alex, you really blew that report. I didn't even know what you were talking about. And I says, what? Let me give me, give me here. And I'll, look, and I'll read it, and I'll say, oh, wow. What was I on when I wrote this? I'm so sorry. I'm going to go fix this. <laughs> like, whoopsie. You know, it's, it's not a big deal. Whereas people who don't have a sense of humor tend to start freaking out. Um, and criticism and feedback are constant in engineering. No one's a good engineer. I, I keep that, I hold that. Uh, no one is good as an engineer. We're all in the process of getting better, right? So it's all about the methodology and the technique, our ability to learn, right? Bringing, uh, speaking of which brings me to the next point is that you have to be flexible, right? So if they see that you're... Oh, through your demeanor or through your coursework, you are really focused on something that tells the industry that you're going to go become an academic, which can be fine, but you're just not going to get a job as a bachelor's degree as easily as someone who's more well-rounded, especially as a bachelor's degree holder. It's actually really important that you maintain your ability to be social and you show that if you're really going to be an academic type of person. And I mean, you are like top 1% smart person. You're into it. You do calculus for fun. Uh, you're doing quantum physics for fun. You're doing all this stuff and it's kind of what you do. Then you're, I'd say you're an academic. Uh, and then continue with academia. Uh, th that could be really good for you. Uh, another suggestion I got from these guys was uh, create work products. And work products, that's a term. Uh, make something, do something. And I don't mean like make a physical device. I was all about building actual things. Uh, but if, you're, if your work product is a conference paper or a publication or a magazine article on what you're doing, 
do that. In other words, do the thing that you want to get hired for now as much as, as much as humanly possible. If you're going to school and you're paying so many tens of thousands of dollars a year, uh, you need to be obsessed with getting a job to the point where you seem a little unbalanced. Uh, I found that by having an obsessive uh, dedication to my work allowed me to just barely make it. I would just barely make it if I was fully obsessed and focused. Anytime I wasn't fully obsessed and focused from day one, uh, the project had failed, right? That, of course, made me a very high-strung person. It took me a while to, like, calm down. That was 10 years ago. About. Yeah, that was about 10 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> uh, second suggest. All right, so the next thing for uh, surviving the housing crisis. What I So all the things I just described are how you get a job. Notice how none of them had to do with going to get more school. Just finish your degree, but focus on doing the thing that you want to do. Do a lot of it. Maintain your personal relationships, maintain your social skills, maintain your sense of humor, uh, and, and just keep trying. I must have applied for like 100 jobs, right? And, and by the way, those social skills, that's how I got my job. It was not through an application. The application was the thing after they decided to hire me, right? I went and met the hiring manager. Uh, they said, we really like you, Alex. Go ahead and apply for the job. Next day, call back. All right, we chose you. <laughs> That's how most jobs get got, right? So you need to be... Uh, the, it, it, I feel bad for anyone who has to pay for virtual schooling right now because the main reason you go to school is networking. What does networking really mean? It just means being friends with people while also maintaining your dignity. That's it. It's not like, you know, schmoozing and kissing butt. We knew people who schmoozed and kissed butt. They didn't really go that far. I, I was a guy who built instrumentation and built stuff. A lot of stuff in college. So I was known as the builder guy, you know? I had a whole club that pretty much just followed me around. Um, the club was actually just a funny scam to get money from the SGA. But it ended up benefiting the entire student body. So is it really a scam? If you <laughs> if you set out to make a legitimate organization, it turns into a scam. Versus I set out to make a scam and it turned into a legitimate organization. Eh, you know, whatever. All's well that ends well. As long as I follow the rules, you can't go after me. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing I did is as soon as I uh, got the job... I did the math and did a full audit of my lifestyle, right? I made a spreadsheet. I'll, put, I'll post a copy of the spreadsheet in the description. Um, but this audit of my lifestyle was intense. It, took in, it basically took into account every single recurring expense I have and tabulated all of it, right? Um, it then, I then made another column where I could make scenarios. So my current scenario was I live in an apartment, I pay... I think it was 850 bucks a month for a one-bedroom apartment in Cockeysville, Maryland. Okay, I pay all this stuff. Okay, what's the what's the um, scenario if I move to a house now, right? And that was actually what made me decide that I'm ready to get a house. And that happened really soon. I got an FHA loan. I beat the deadline the IRS had. There's a deadline that if you did not buy a house on this date, then your uh, you will always have um, mortgage insurance premiums. Uh, for your FHA loan, right? Usually, it used to be that you'd get to 20% of your principal, and then the mortgage insurance premium would go away, which is like 250 bucks a month for me. That was a lot of money, uh, but I managed to get in uh, just in time to get. So now, once I got to 20%, that went away. I had almost nothing to put down on that house. I, I had almost nothing. But here's the deal, right? Second strategy. So now that you got the job, uh, I bought that house and I had bedrooms to, to, to let out, right? Uh, the way I strategized it as I wanted one full bedroom per, uh, sorry, one full bathroom per bedroom, right? Cause, cause no roommates, I mean, you're looking at bottom of the bait, you know, sorry guys, I used to be this way by the way, so I don't mean to be insulting, but if you share, if you rent out a room and you have to share a bathroom, you feel like you're, um, not exactly the top or even the midpoint of the barrel. You're kind of at the, you know, last part of the barrel, uh, somewhere in the proximity of the bottom of the barrel. Uh, you don't want to rent out to those kind of people because, I mean, sometimes they're really nice, but sometimes they're really not. I wanted to rent out to other people like me. In fact, I wanted to rent out to new coworkers, people who started the company, because then I'd have all their background check and everything would be done for me. And I knew they had stable employment because they work, you know, down the hall from me. So no questions, right? So I had a basement, bedroom, full bathroom, Upstairs, there was a master bedroom, master bathroom. There's also a uh, hallway bedroom, hallway, full bathroom, right? So I had three bedrooms, three bathrooms. 
Uh, I probably paid sixteen hundred for the mortgage, and I rented each of those bedrooms for about seven hundred bucks. So sixteen hundred minus fourteen. I paid. So in other words, I paid about two hundred fifty bucks a month uh, for my place for me to live. So I went from eight hundred and twenty-two dollars of rent down to about two hundred bucks, two fifty bucks, you know, whatever, uh, in housing expenses. That's pretty good. Okay, that's the second part. Uh, you need to. That's not to say that you should go out and buy a house. What I did was I did the math. I did it. I did a very detailed analysis on my spreadsheet. I'll include it in the description. Plug in your numbers. Go through it. See what you got. You might find out that you can't afford to live in your current lifestyle. I include stuff like liquor allowance on there, by the way, because I was like, I need to make sure my drinking is under control, uh, that I'm doing it responsibly, and make sure that my like um, choice of vehicle was good. I've got a, a part where I have like the car payment, insurance, gas, maintenance, uh, estimated maintenance, all that stuff. So. In closing, the engineer's lifestyle here, you know, the engineer's perspective is that you need to know what your requirements are so you can get the job, make your money, and then you need to do the math to figure out what you can afford. It's all about, all this is about recognizing uh, needs, recognizing requirements, and then knowing what you need to execute on it, like w quantifying what's going on, your lifestyle. And my life's been pretty good. I sold that house for about $50,000 profit just a month ago. Not, I have zero debt now. I have zero debt. I, I could... I can go become a public school teacher if I felt like it, but that's not happening. Not now with the salaries they got. You jump that up, you jump the public school salary up to about 80, 85 grand, and then I might consider the nearly 50 grand pay cut I would take to go do that job. But I'm not going to take like a hundred, I'm not taking a hundred, I'm not taking a six figure pay cut to go work at a public school. All right, that's not happening. Come on, step your game up, guys. We spend $15,000 per student per year. You guys can afford to pay your teachers more than freaking awful awful wages <laughs> if they paid te uh, I, i'm gonna make another video on that but if you paid teachers 80 grand you would get some real competition for teachers that's what i'm telling you right now all right that's enough of this this has been the alex manasa thank you guys for watching and i'll see you guys next time i'll post these uh videos thinking out loud videos every monday through friday once a day about 7 15 seems to be the way timing all right have a good one bye mm -hmm.